Lea Brobi Dunlin. She is the Israeli spokesperson and director of international relations of the Parents Civil Families Forum, a group of 600 Israeli and Palestinian families who lost close family members. So you always had this urge for peace, for making the world a better place. Can we say that? Well, I think that's a bit of a doubt. Yes, I think there's a sense of social justice and the need for change and that really is the picture of my life, that's true. I, so I heard that your sons were, or are, one of them still, peacemaking people. They, are not, they were not really feeling the urge to go to the military. Well, they have not, no choice, it's not yes. a question. And if you decide, it's very rare that you would get let off the army for um, being uh, against war, you know? So what they would do is put you in jail, and then you would come out of jail, and then you would go back to jail until it, you either you know, time goes by that way. Yes. So uh, both David and his son went to compulsory military service, but it's not only that. It's also part of how you grow up. You know, you don't know who these kids are behind the gun. It's not exactly um, that they were these great pacifists. They weren't. They were human beings that grew up in a situation where they knew they would have to go to the army. And, um, but David was killed not while he was doing his military service. He was killed in the reserves. That's a very different thing. You know, all of this question of the army is so difficult. I have a grandson now. Okay. And he's 17. For no second. From Iran. Iran, yes. yes. And um, I'm so happy that he has a bad back. He can't go to a military, to a fighting unit. Do you see how absurd that is that the grandmother's happy that her grandson has a bad back so he can't be in yes. a fighting unit? I can understand, it's not absurd. But that's really a sick society in many ways. It is, yes. So, well, unfortunately, the other son, as we said, was killed. You wrote a letter when uh, the killer of your son was jailed. Look, it was much easier if they had not caught this man. I know this sounds strange, but the minute they caught him, there was a face, so I could not do this work if I wasn't willing to walk the talk. So I really didn't sleep for a very long time after that story because I didn't know what to do. How can I go around the world talking about peace and love and reading bad poetry and all this kind of thing if I don't mean it? Sure. And so, yes, I wrote a letter to the family and um, I told them who David was, that he was doing his masters in the philosophy of education and that he was part of the peace movement and that he didn't want to serve in the occupied territories. But you see, here again comes this whole dilemma about what to do. If I don't go, what happens to my students? He was teaching philosophy to kids who were going to be inducted into the army. And if I don't go, what will happen uh, to my soldiers because he was the officer? And if I do go, I'll treat people with dignity and so will my soldiers. So you see, here it is. We don't yes. know the man behind the gun. Yes. Yes. And we don't know what they're faced with. And um, he was killed by a Palestinian sniper. There's nothing that you can do after that. It is so, your life becomes completely different. It's before and after, and it's what you choose to do. And so there was quite a period of time before they caught the sniper and quite a period of time before I wrote that letter. Once the face appeared, I couldn't really do any work with integrity. And uh, two Palestinians from our group actually delivered that letter to the family who were very shocked. I mean, they couldn't imagine that the mother of somebody their son had killed 
would write that kind of letter and I asked to meet them because I think we owe that to our children and grandchildren. But that's also a lot of my South African background with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and things that happened there. Now you are going around the world, as you said, talking about peace, talking about integration uh, with this circle of families. Uh, you are 600 people. You, what do you see when you talk to young people about this? Do you see a positive reaction? Do you see difficulties? I think it would be very difficult for anybody, whatever age, not to have some form of emotional breakthrough when they hear that private narrative of somebody. And if I tell my story, I, I never in all the years had somebody who reacted uh, in a cruel way to hearing my story. Um, before I started talking, there would be somebody who said, don't listen to this woman, she's poisoning your mind, mm -hmm. you know, or uh, do demonstrations against me. In Milano, actually, when I had my film in Milano, so uh, the pro-Palestinian Italians, of course there were no Palestinians there, um, came to make a demonstration against me. Well, they did that to David yeah. Grossman as well, a very famous yes. Israeli author who was very left-wing. And um, so the police came, and it was very dramatic, and I wouldn't let them arrest them. And I invited them to come and watch the film, because that's this work. You know, I could be very happy if they got arrested. That's what they wanted, mm -hmm. by the of way. Of course, yes. But if I invited them, and they were pretty sheepish by the end of the film, you know, they didn't know exactly what to do with themselves, they were quite tearful. And yes. That's the way that you work. So even people who don't agree with you are usually moved by a true narrative that comes from another place when they see your humanity. Yes. So do you see difference from yesterday and today? Is there any kind of, do you think, improvement in the society or...? No, I think society is much worse. Yes. And maybe this is a cycle, as well. you know? yes. it might be a cycle and um, it's very frightening because there's such a polarization in every nation almost, yes. including here. And then when there's the polarization, you don't talk to the other and then they become more radical. And we're not willing to listen to each other anymore with any kind of empathy, even if we don't agree. Yes. Just watch television, that's enough to tell you. When they have these panels, you can't actually work up what anybody said because they are talking over each other. Sure. I mean, I get a lot of talkbacks every time I write something for the newspaper. I get the sort of talkbacks that I should burn in Auschwitz and you know get raped and all kinds of charming. Uh, yes. yes. But you can't allow that to affect who you are because your situation is to affect who is around you. And yes, it becomes more difficult because the youth, we work a lot in schools, mm -hmm. you know, and because they don't even know where they're going in the army, they have no idea where the West Bank is. I know that sounds extraordinary. They don't speak Arabic. They've never met a Palestinian. So why would they? And so they are very fearful, and that fear creates anger and hatred. And so lots of the work that we do is to try to break down these barriers so we can see the humanity in each other. I don't really talk about peace. I talk about reconciliation. I think peace is a very huge word now. Yes. At the end, education is the word to be, to prevent also education, because the more you know, the better it is. Well, I think our leaders could do with a bit yes. of education too. Yeah. yeah, I know. Because we don't know from history. You know, there's this whole idea of trying to bring the Palestinians to their knees by removing all funding. Well, you can't expect to have peace if you bring somebody to their knees. And so, um, there's so much to be done. But you can't give up, you know. Yeah. There are lots of dark forces, but uh, I cannot imagine my life and I cannot imagine looking at my grandchildren if I didn't do every possible thing that I could to try to allow others to see the humanity of the Palestinian and vice versa.
course. Because it's like a mirror. You know, whatever I say, some other parasite would say. And if I go into a house of women, I believe women have to come to the table now. Yes. So if you go into, and I go a lot in the West Bank to houses of women, and when you go inside and you, they look at you with quite a lot of antagonism until you really start to speak, but why wouldn't they? Sure. Because every person that they've ever met that's Israeli is either in uniform or is a settler. So why would they think I'm any different? But when you've made that emotional breakthrough by them understanding your humanity, it's an extraordinary thing to watch how suddenly the, the most angry of them becomes your friend. Yes. Forgiveness is something for, different for everybody. Some people come to forgiving through their religion. Um, and if that works, that's fine. I just don't think that you can do it to absolve yourself. Uh, forgiving is a gift. And uh, for me, it's more about giving up the right to revenge. And understanding why. And so if you take a room, you know, last night we had a dinner here. And of course, I always had to throw an elephant in the room. So I asked everybody what they meant by forgiving. And of course, we had eight people with eight different answers. So it's a very difficult subject and very personal. And do I have the right to forgive in the name of my child? I don't think so. I can forgive for me. I believe in restorative justice. I think that's a very, very important new uh, movement all over the world. And I hope that that will become more and more popular because I see a solace in both sides. And I actually offered that to the man who killed David to perhaps go through restorative justice if he wants to. It's not, I can't decide for him. It's meeting with the perpetrator to meet with the victim or the survivor, mm. whichever you want to call it. I don't like the word victim. You would meet, normally there's a go-between. You see, most people use the word mediator. Yes. I don't like the word mediator either because that means a compromise. But I like the word go-between. I think it has a, a better connotation. So it's usually to work with the perpetrator because they don't always want to meet the person. Uh, uh, the survivor and vice versa and it's a process and it's something that can be very painful but that would bring a tremendous amount of peace to both sides and you might meet like once every I don't know how it depends like... it might just be a completion of something and you never see that person again it doesn't mean oh, okay. it doesn't that mean you become that. their friend or anything like that that's not part of it, but it's a completion. But I don't care always, where it is, I think yes. it's terribly important to talk. If you don't talk, you, you'll shoot. Yes, human being, you can find human being anywhere. Well, it's an extraordinary thing to see how you can soften the whole room when a person tells their personal story. You know, and, and in classrooms, even with bullies. Yes. If you've got all these kids to say where they came from, and, and even if they were young, I did this in San Diego. I asked the students who have no idea about Israel and Palestine to tell me where their grandmothers came from. And it was such an extraordinary session because each one had a story. I did a workshop with a group of, there were people who didn't know what happened to their children, and also with bereaved mothers. And there was one sitting next to me and I could see she wanted to talk, but she needed me to tell my story to feel safe enough to tell her this. And she told us her story, and it was vile, horrible, um, graphic detail of losing her husband and son. And it was the first time she ever told her story. And watching her the next day, her whole face was all clean. So how can you ask me where, well, you know, I would go anywhere if that sort of thing could come out of it? And I can't give up hope. No, it's not we can give up hope. That is no. the yes. whole reason of this organization. Yes, yes. It's 
since Trump decided to cut off all our funding, 30% of our funding, we don't have a big staff, but we do have two of everything in Israel and Palestine because that is our way of dignity. You know? So there will be two directors, two spokespeople, two education directors. It's very important because sure. that's our way of not being patronizing. It makes it much more difficult. Yeah, you know, of course. Of course. Yeah. But it is a gesture of trying in a very unequal situation to have equality. So are you, how, how are you financed? Because you said you're a Well, we work government. very well. I find the American public to be extremely generous. generous. It's true. I think more yes. so than anywhere in Europe, and I think Americans are a lot less cynical. And so there is a sense of sometimes you can inspire people here more easily to do something. I'm not only talking about money, mm. which of course is very necessary because yes. if we don't have that, we can't do the work on the ground. Yes. But it's also a support of them taking our stories and telling other people that we have this wonderful book that's coming out. That's it's right. it's called A Perigon, and it's written by a famous uh, Irish author. And it uh, tells the story of Bassam, who uh, should have been here, mm -hmm. and of Rami, two fathers who lost their daughter. And so they have this tremendous bond, you know, they've been friends for years. And it's a beautiful, beautiful book, which will come out in a couple of days. Okay. Yes, in the US. US. Yes. And uh, Steven Spielberg bought the rights to this book, so hopefully, we see so another big way to, to give out our message. The long-term vision is to create a framework for a reconciliation process, which has to become an integral part of any future political peace agreement. Mm. Because without that, you know, all we can hope for at best is a ceasefire until the next time. So all the work that we do on the ground, we work in schools, we have a summer camp, we have young ambassadors who are graduates from the summer camp. But our flagship program, the one that your beloved president decided was not necessary, uh, is a parallel narr narrative program. Mm. It's a kind of history through the human eye. And that is a very important program because we have more than a thousand alumni from there. And those alumni go back into their villages and give the message that they got. It's a wonderful program that can be adapted to all over the world. I, uh, I think it could have been used in Charlottesville, for instance, but that's going much more deeply into the program. And in Sri Lanka and everywhere, because it's understanding how each side sees their history. And even if you don't agree, you would create empathy. And that's the beginning of ending conflict. You could find us at www.theparentscircle.org and uh, we have a web that's the website and on the website would give you all the information. We also have an American newsletter which people could sign up for through the website. I think they, it would be very good because then people would know that we're going to be in their city, Washington, uh, California. And actually now for this book tour, um, Rami and Bassam will be in New York at the, what's it, the 92nd Street Y? 92nd Street Y. Yes, together with the author. And they will be in Boston and in Pittsburgh and in San Francisco. And so if you had people who got our newsletter, they would hear about that. But they can actually read about, uh, a lot of it will come out in, in the media. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Okay. To be read slowly. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Grazie. 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 Grazie.